Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, I'm filling in today as moderator for Lauren Wenzel uh, with the NOAA National MPA Center. Uh, this webinar series is uh, put on by the NOAA National MPA Center and also co-sponsored by openchannels.org, MPA News, and the EBM Tools Network. Um, so before I get before I introduce our speaker, um, I like to let everyone know that uh, we really like for these webinars to be interactive and you can uh, type in questions uh, throughout the presentation as well as after, after the presentation during the question and answer session by um, just typing into the question panel in your user interface and then I as moderator will relay those questions to Will. And I'd like to uh, introduce Will Underwood, uh, who is with the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources and the Grand Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, Will is the stewardship coordinator at Gra the Grand Bay NEAR uh, and in Moss Point, Mississippi. He is trained as a wildlife biologist and has a broad interest in the natural systems of the southeast. He is responsible for land management and resource monitoring on the 1,800-acre research reserve. He's heavily involved in working uh, to understand the impacts of sea level rise on marsh vegetation. He also works to make sure the reserve is prepared to respond to natural and man-made disasters. The Gulf oil spill in 2011 highlighted the need for reserves to be more proactive and systematic in their readiness to respond to disasters. And he is going to... Uh, talk to us all about that today. All right, Will, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today about disaster response planning. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm the stewardship coordinator at the Grand Bay Reserve. And as stewardship coordinator, those of you that know the reserve system know that stewardship coordinators wear a lot of different hats. Uh, we're typically involved in land management and resource protection, long-term monitoring, but we also fall into that realm of, of disaster response planning as that affects our resources. So I'm going to talk to you today a bit about uh, what drove us to develop a disaster response plan, some of the steps that we took, and some of the things about reserve system that, that are unique that also help to drive how your plan was developed. And sometimes it freezes up. Yep, now it's moving. Thank okay. You. So first, I need to make sure we all understand the NEAR system. Uh, it's a little bit unique, uh, established as part of the Coastal Zone Management Act. Uh, these are NOAA-sponsored programs that are in partnership with a state partner. Uh, while these are managed by a state agency, uh, the core boundaries within each reserve are actually defined as NOAA trust resources. And so that makes a big difference when it comes to a, a federal response in that the, these boundaries are NOAA trust resources. Uh, the reserves are staffed and managed by a state partner or agency. Here in Mississippi, we are uh, partnered with the Department of Marine Resources, and so we are state employees, but our funding is primary, primarily federal. Uh, just a bit more about the system. In general, there are 28 reserves around the country. You can see these are scattered in estuarine areas uh, across the coast and the Great Lakes. And being in these estuarine areas puts us at risk for a number of natural and man-made disasters. Uh, living on that edge where estuaries meet the sea uh, puts us at great risk for things like hurricanes and, and a lot of heavy industry is located in these areas as well. So we have a, a great task to protect these areas and so planning is, is key to providing some uh, forward thinking towards that, towards that goal. In general, the reserve system uh, has the goals of practicing promoting stewardship of these coasts and estuaries. And we do this through research, education, and training and we have a place-based system of protected areas. And so those protected areas are there for long-term monitoring and research related to the estuary and how we protect those for future generations. So we have three major focus areas, those being water quality, habitat protection, and climate change. And so the ability to respond to a disaster uh, obviously tightly ties to all of these focus areas. And, and the better prepared we are, the better we can protect the resources. We work through four distinct sectors within the reserve system. Research, which provides for uh, both on-site and facilitation of research. Education, which provides outreach for K-12 and, and community education. Stewardship, which uh, can be things such as uh, resource management, uh, use by, by outside people, uh, and also uh, habitat restoration. 
and then our coastal training program, which provides trainings to decision makers as well as uh, local uh, resource professionals. Just to give you a little context for Grand Bay, we're located on the northern gulf along the eastern edge of Mississippi's Gulf Coast. Bring us in a little closer. Uh, just for context later in the discussion, you can see Grand Bay at the northern part of your screen and about 150 miles south of us, that's the wellhead from the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So that, that spill happened about 150 miles south of us, yet we still receive major impacts. And so that just kind of gives you a sense of scale in, in thinking when you're, you're planning for disaster response. We have to be thinking broadly and locally. Bringing things in a little closer, you can see that the Grand Bay Reserve is located uh, very near to some, some uh, industry as well as, as dense uh, human habitation. So Mobile Bay to the east with the city of Mobile northeast of us, uh, directly west of the reserve boundary, you see the city of Pascagoula, uh, which has some very heavy industry, uh, some refineries and chemical plants as well as large shipyards. And then Gulfport a little farther, Gulfport and Biloxi a little farther over to the west. Uh, we're located within the Mississippi Sound, uh, which provides some protection from uh, the onshore migration of things like oil spills, but you notice all the, the passes between the barrier islands that provide for, for a lot of uh, current to bring things into the Sound. And once things get into the Sound, they tend to stay there. So we, we can uh, have prolonged events with something like an oil spill. Uh, the marshes at Grand Bay are fairly unique, while west estuaries in general are places where a river meets the sea, uh, we don't have a river that flows through the Grand Bay estuaries. Uh, this 18,000 acre reserve uh, was formed by the, by the forces of the Pascual River, which, which fell into its present day channel about 12,000 years ago. And so we're rapidly losing shoreline to coastal erosion as a natural process and, uh, and looking at impacts related to sea level rise. Uh, the marshes at Grand Bay are primarily black needle rush with fringing spartina alternate flora. And as with the low elevation, uh, they're very at risk for things for sea level rise as well as incidents such as oil spills and other chemical spills. One of the functions of the reserve is to provide for long-term uh, protection and monitoring these sites. And so we do habitat mapping and change analysis as well as another a variety of other resource monitoring efforts these can prove very useful in, in response to a disaster. So what makes these marshes important, uh, not just at Grand Bay, but also throughout the system, obviously these marshes serve as a nursery ground for many of our commercially and recreationally important fishes and shell shellfish. They also provide protection from dangerous storm surge. Uh, Grand Bay uh, was subjected to the impacts of Hurricane Katrina, uh, 17 feet of water at our boat ramp, and yet most of the trees survived that event. Uh, the, the, storm surge came in and was buffered by the, the marsh and the trees and, and basically did very little uh, habitat damage during that spill. Obviously there was, there was a lot of property damage from Katrina, but as far as in the reserve itself, not a whole lot of damage related to the storm. Uh, these marshes filter nutrients, provide for that commercial and recreational fishing opportunity, and also other outdoor recreation such as kayaking. We protect a number of very significant resources and resources that are always at risk. Uh, tidal and estuary marsh habitats. Uh, these habitats along the northern gulf have historically been uh, converted, uh, drained for mosquito control and other uh, for development. And so the marshes at Grand Bay are some of the last best marshes left in Mississippi. So our, our mandate to protect those is important. We also have some of the best submerged aquatic vegetation resources in nearshore Mississippi. And those are obviously very sensitive to disturbance from vessel traffic, from oil spills and other chemical spills as well as just increased turbidity related to other events. We have coastal transition habitats that provide for upslope migration of the marsh. These habitats are at risk as well. Uh, oyster reefs, obviously. We also have some cultural resources here at the reserve. We have at least 12 to 15 major Native American middens that are recognized and have been studied. And so uh, during Deepwater Horizon, those were things that had to be protected from disaster from the oil actually reaching those sites. Uh, quite a bit of shore and water bird foraging and nesting habitat, and once again that fish and shellfish nursery habitat. And so we spend a good bit of time monitoring these resources. Uh, we do water quality monitoring, habitat mapping and change analysis, 
biological monitoring, both emergent marsh, marsh aquatic vegetation, uh, some, some near sites actually do mangrove monitoring as well, and then something that we call sentinel site monitoring that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the backbone of the reserve system is what we call the system-wide monitoring program, which is based around a system of water level uh, or water quality meters. And so each reserve has at least four of these, of these meters that are basically constantly checking water quality, and that information is sent back to a centralized office and is available for researchers, for education uses, and a variety of other things. And oftentimes these these data signs can pick up the first signs of a chemical spill or of, of some other water quality issue. And so they're very important for that long-term record, but also in, in engaging in disaster response. Uh, the near Sentinel site is a, is a program that we have uh, to understand how sea level rise or sea level changes are affecting marsh plants and the movement of those plants over time. And so we have fine-scale measurement of the marsh building process over time, uh, monitoring of local water levels, monitoring and tracking changes in that marsh vegetation over time. And one of the key components of this is all the data are referenced to a common vertical datum. That allows us to understand the relationship of those heights. Uh, all of this data works to provide baseline data that's very useful uh, in determining how to recover from a disaster. Our research program, uh, we have that system-wide monitoring program that I mentioned in the past. We've had a graduate research fellowship program that is provided for funding for graduate students to do work on reserves. Each NEAR has a site profile, which is an ecological characterization of the site, and that can prove very useful to responders and especially to restoration efforts following a disaster. Uh, we also coordinate research with our agency, universities, NOAA, and other NEARs, and we try to apply that research to both local and regional issues. Being an estuarine environment, uh, we are subject to quite a few what we call natural stressors. Uh, hurricanes is the first one that pops to most people's mind. Uh, there was an analysis of swamp data some years ago that, that indicated that hurricanes just barely show up as a blip to the natural system. Uh, if you, if they're almost noise in the system compared to some of the other impacts we might see. And so hurricanes primarily seem to affect our, our built resources, but it is something that we have to think about in disaster response planning and how we would respond to that. Coastal erosion can be a major factor in some areas, especially if you have sensitive infrastructure or uh, you know, personal dwellings in those areas. Uh, now changes in freshwater inflow can affect estuaries. We have quite a few problems with invasive species. And then changes in weather and climate patterns can directly impact these estuaries. Anthropogenic stressors are those that oftentimes cause us the most concern excess nutri nutrients, industrial development. Uh, you know, in the past, we've, we've tried to put industry out of sight of most civilization, and so industry got stuck in these estuarine areas as the water source and just to get it away from the public. And so here at Grand Bay, we have some major heavy industry on the western side of the reserve. Uh, we have a major refinery as well as a major chemical factory uh, that produces fertilizer, and both those sites have at times had releases that have uh, potentially damaged resources. Uh, over overharvest of fisheries, uh, the loss of sediment through dredging, crop scarring, and other decreased water quality parameters uh, can also decrease the quality of the estuary. And obviously industrial disasters is one of the things we think about most often. Uh, pipeline failures, uh, vessel groundings, train derailments, all these things that can typically interact with a, a reserve and cause damage on that site. So there are things we have to plan for. So why do we have to worry about disaster response in general? Uh, we have a mandate to protect our resources. Uh, we have a mandate to protect these sites for the long-term integrity for that research and monitoring component uh, without significant manipulation. Uh, we often have local knowledge of the resources, and we're also often the first to report a disaster situation. We may be the first to see a vessel grounding. We may be the first to find oil washing into the estuary. Uh, we have to protect these resources that are often near industry and other uh, other threats. Uh, just to give you some examples, locally, uh, one of the local industri industrial sites is the Mississippi Phosphates Corporation uh, has a chemical plant. Uh, they produce uh, phosphate fertilizer at this site, and so they actually uh, receive their rock by rail train. They have a sulfuric acid generating plant on site where they wash the rock with that. And uh, they basically 
in the two mounds that you can see on the, the northwest portion of that image, they actually store on site the waste gypsum from that process. And that gypsum has a, a very low pH, and it is uh, slightly radioactive, and so they store it on site. Uh, in the past five or six years, they've had many releases above and beyond their, their permitted release, and those have directly affected the waters of Grand Bay. And so that's a site, that's an ongoing disaster, you might say, that we monitor on a regular basis, but also have to respond to when they have a chronic release related to a tropical storm or hurricane event. This slide it will show you a couple of examples of events they've had. Uh, tropical Storm Lee in 2011, uh, you see the pH in Bangs Lake, which is the water body directly adjacent to the reserve or to the, the phosphates plant, dropped to below four in a matter of a few hours. Uh, related to a very high rainfall event that released water from the containment dike around that facility. Uh, they also had a very major release in 2005. Millions of gallons of that phosphate-laden water made it into the waters of Bangs Lake, causing a massive fish kill. And more recently, in 2012, you can see that uh, another release across the summer of 2012, you can actually see the, the dead vegetation there showing up as green in that uh, slide in the upper right corner. And so disasters like that are ongoing and things that we have to monitor on that long-term basis and, and respond to in the proper way. Obviously, hurricanes are a con continued threat to us here on the coast, a continuous threat that we have to worry about uh, with our infrastructure, primarily our, our long-term monitoring programs and our, our research sites. And Hurricane Katrina was, was one of the uh, worst disasters on, in the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Uh, here at the reserve, the facility was, was flooded uh, lost some boats and equipment, and since has been rebuilt in a, in a much higher capacity to, to basically avoid those floodwaters. But hurricanes are something that we constantly have to be on guard for. Uh, as an agency and as, as an ear, we, we basically, beginning with the beginning of hurricane season, we're on high alert. Uh, we check all of our resources, make sure they're ready for evacuation or deployment if they need to be. Uh, the major focus of of us developing a disaster response plan uh, began with the hurricane, or with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And for those of you that remember that spill, it was a major event out in the Gulf, as I mentioned, about 150 yards offshore, 150 miles offshore, excuse me. And the rig exploded on April 20th of that year, and within a few days, we had boom covering the entire reserve. About 12 miles of boom had been deployed to protect the reserve. Uh, much of that was deployed really before anyone had a chance to think about the impacts that the boom or the booming operation might be. It was more of a, we better get it in place before we run out of boom. It was almost a month uh, to the day that we had the first oil inside the reserve. So we had a month of response where the booming was uh, continued every day. The booms would break free and go up into the marsh. It had to be retrieved. So quite a bit of potential damage there before we ever had oil into the reserve. Uh, that oiling continued for a, a while across the Gulf. Uh, they installed that temporary cap in July, and we were targeted to have all the boom removed from the near on August 31st. And so we had a very prolonged response there. And during that response, there were a lot of issues that we saw, a lot of ways that we were left out of the response and didn't feel like we had a voice in how things were handled within this, this NOAA trust resource and also a state protected area. And so it really prompted us to think about how should we be responding to these kind of disasters, uh, what kind of place do we have within the response structure, and how can we better make ourselves uh, both useful and also have our voice heard. Uh, as you know, the response is still ongoing in some areas of the Gulf related to the deep water spill. During the spill, as I mentioned, response injuries are some of the biggest things that we saw. So here is, is boom deployment happening. You notice the the uh, prop scoring there, they're basically tearing up the bottom with these very large boats that were setting boom in our very shallow waters of the reserve. Uh, much of the, the waters in Grand Bay are, are three feet or less, and so these big crew boats that were placing this boom uh, were, were basically tearing up the bottom. And at, at the beginning of the response, we had very little way to get out there and tell the folks where they needed to be going, how to avoid these waters, and what were the critical resources to protect. Uh, we, we had a continuous conversation and and uh, task of trying to keep the airboats out of the marsh. They used airboats to deploy boom in these areas and, and the very rough waters at times 
And so these guys would, would park themselves up in the marsh to try to avoid getting beat up by the waves and in turn were, were compacting the marsh vegetation and causing damage. And also lots of boiling and, and just deployment of, of materials up in the marsh, actually using the marsh as a platform to work off of, which obviously caused some damage. And so we were constantly working to try to insert our voice there to say, what are the resources to protect? How can we get folks out of these marshes and still do their job? And so it really, really drove home to us the point that we needed to have a, a centralized and unified way to communicate with people about the resources at risk. Uh, six months after the spill, we actually found some of the most major damage. Uh, what you're looking at here in the slide are actually airboat scars across the marsh. So these are areas where the responders took shortcuts to save themselves 10 minutes and actually lowered the marsh elevation in those areas to the point that it was either open water or changed the species composition of the marsh. And these sites are still visible on aerial imagery three years later. And so obviously that, that once again drove home that need to have better communication with responders and better oversight as to how they actually interacted with the environment. So th some things that we learned from the Deepwater Horizon spill that, that pushed us towards the need for disaster response preparedness we really were unprepared to integrate into the incident command system and also into local emergency operations. Uh, being a state agency that manages land that is a, a federal trust resource, we were unsure of our role in response at times, uh, both as our, within our agency and also at higher levels. Uh, our staff was undertrained in some response safety and techniques. Uh, we found that we, we didn't know what training we needed that had not been identified ahead of time. We didn't know what, per, what safety uh, training as far as uh, personal equipment, things like that that we needed. And so there was a big learning curve to get us prepared to help respond to the spill. And we figured out that we needed a centralized and systematic method of maintaining our preparedness, but also something that could grow with us and could change over time. We also figured out some things that we don't do. We're not first responders. We're not medical professionals. We're not law enforcement. So our role is a little different in a response than some other agencies might be. Uh, and one thing that, that we had to make clear to a lot of the first responders is that our job is to protect natural resources, but we also understand that human life and safety are their first priority and also our first priority. We would never put our own staff or anyone else's staff in, in danger to protect a resource. We figured our, our best role in disaster response at the NEAR was to provide relevant data and consultation regarding the natural resources in the area, how to best protect those. Uh, we provided lots of guidance uh, to assist with transport of field crews, how to avoid things like seagrass beds, uh, how to avoid those Native American middens. We provided mapping information and support. We served as a staging area at times. And also hosting and providing trainings is something we, we determined was very important role for us to play. Uh, just as for instance here, uh, Grand Bay, as I mentioned, has some very significant seagrass resources. And uh, those grass resources are spread across the reserve in shallow waters. Uh, those are exactly the areas where the contractors decided to put boom during the response. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you once again see that image of, of boom deployment uh, causing prop scarring and damage to the bottom. Well, those areas were being uh, those areas were being basically impacted in a very bad way by the response. But we had no voice early in the spill on how to fix that. So early in the spill, we realized that one of the things that we needed to do was elevate the awareness of the reserves within the response community and also within the agency and within, within NOAA. Uh, we noticed early on that the reserve boundaries, so a NOAA trust resource, were actually missing from the incident command center maps. Here at Grand Bay, we actually overlap with the Grand Bay National Wildlife Refuge, which did show up on the maps. Grand Bay Reserve did not show up on response maps. Uh, the local emergency operations center didn't necessarily understand our role or recognize our role in resource protection. Uh, many of the first responders had misconceptions about what we do and so we knew that we needed a plan. After uh, lots of consultation with folks at NOAA and others, uh, we actually received directed funding from the NOAA Disaster Response Center uh, to develop disaster response plans for the five Gulf of Mexico estuarine research reserves. 
we developed a contract with Tetra Tech Consulting Group uh, to help develop these plans, and they also developed a template for us to use around the NEAR system. Uh, since the development of that template, uh, several other reserves have received funding following Hurricane Sandy to develop uh, plans for their reserves, and that plant, that template has now been shared throughout the system and is available outside of the system for folks to develop plans based on, on the work that we've done here in the Gulf. One of the first steps in, in developing a disaster response plan is evaluating the hazards and incidents that you're at risk for, uh, for impacting your resources. Uh, one thing you have to realize early on is you can't plan for every possible contingency. Uh, a HIRA, the Hazard and Incident Risk Assessment, is a worksheet that you go through with possible things that would impact your resources and how those rank. And so you do an internal ranking among your staff of, of these possible incidents. Uh, incidents and disasters you could, that could impact you and things that you have some control over. Uh, this ranking is really only as good as the people that are in the room. Uh, you need to have expert opinions. Uh, you need to be realistic in things. You might have a, something that might show up on that list that is just totally out of the realm of possibility and you don't want to waste your time working on that potential risk. And, so you, and you also can, can group things and the things that you would respond in a similar manner can all be handled in the same kind of risk assessment. And so that's a very important first step is to go through that hazard and risk assessment. And it can be very useful to involve your local response community into that ranking process. And so this, this next slide shows you an example of a hazard and risk assessment. Uh, we sat down and went through this here at Grand Bay. We actually had stakeholder workshops to do this. And so we were going through and ranking things, adding things to this list if we thought they were important. And so ranking how a hurricane might affect life, health, and property uh, how it might affect the physical or biological environment, and then looking at the economy. So how is it going to direct the, how is it going to affect the economy of the near, of the natural resources, and then of that local or regional business. And so basically adding all those together, running it through a spreadsheet, and coming up with a, r a ranking of how these different events are going to affect your site it can give you an idea of how you want to prioritize your resources and your planning. This is a very adaptive process. Uh, you can bring in experts on certain areas of this, and it's really something that's best done by a group of people that know the resource well and also know the response capability. As I mentioned, we held a stakeholder meeting. <coughs> we invited local resource professionals, local industry, uh, and the local response community. Getting all those people in the room at one time uh, was probably one of the most beneficial parts of this disaster response planning process. Uh, we were able to clearly establish some definitions. When you say resources to a first responder, they're thinking about what vehicles do you have, what boats do you have, what can we use to respond to a disaster. Uh, when we were saying resources, meaning we want to protect our seagrass beds, we want to protect our emergent marsh. And so clearly establishing those definitions was very important early on. Uh, educating responders about natural resources that were at risk. One of the things that came out of this process is that we, we developed fact sheets that could be given to first responders that were very quick and easy for them to look at and say, these are the resources that we need to avoid, or here are the sites that we need to avoid, or here's who we need to talk to if we encounter this kind of a resource in the field. And it also was important to let the local responders know of our vulnerability, uh, the vulnerability of our long-term research plots and equipment to their response activities. Another thing that came out of that workshop was an understanding of the need to communicate more regularly with the industry and first responders. Uh, because of that workshop, we've been in much closer contact with, uh, with several of the, the major industries to the west of the reserve, and we've been more regularly involved in the emergency operations center with the county. Uh, once again, we developed those fact sheets. Those have been very important to hand out to folks who visit the reserve. Uh, you know, some, with some resources, we can provide maps with others uh, that are critical. Uh, the Native American middens, obviously we don't provide maps of those to the general public because that would put those sites at risk, but responders need to know where those sites are so that they can avoid impacting them. And it also allowed us to establish lines of communication with the local gov government and the emergency operations center in the county. So what will a disaster response plan do for you? It's going to centralize your contact information for agencies, responders, and the responsible parties it's going to provide a systematic course of action for responding to incidents and disasters. 
uh, very importantly, it's going to clearly define a chain of command and areas of responsibility in responding to a disaster. It's also going to identify the training needs and training schedules for your staff. Uh, with many of the trainings that you, that you need to respond to a disaster, things like maybe the Haswalker training, those are good for a certain time period, and if you miss the, the refresher course on those, you have to take the whole course over again. So it's very important to, as a staff, develop a, an idea of when you need to have retraining, when you need to have updates or refresher courses so that you don't have trainings that lapse. Uh, oftentimes, especially with Deepwater Horizon, there weren't enough trainers to go around to get folks trained up on some of the safety procedures. So some of the major components of a disaster response plan as we, as we pursued it, uh, there's an introduction section that gives you the purpose of the plan, a list of other relevant plans, uh, provides some basic site information, gives your authorities for response. And that's something that's very site specific, and especially in the near system because we each have a, a different relationship with the state agency they work with. Here in Mississippi, the Department of Marine Resources is not a resource trustee. The Department of Environmental Quality holds the state trustee status. So it puts us in a different status when it comes to responding to something uh, that, that's going to require a natural resource damage assessment. So understanding your authorities for response is very important. Uh, the scope of the plan, once again, and, and the assumptions that you're making, getting those definitions clear so that everybody understands and is on the same page. Uh, we look at emergency planning factors. So you have to think about the resources at risk. And once again, people come first in the situation. We have to protect our, our personnel. We have to keep them out of harm's way. Then we need to think about infrastructure. Uh, obviously, infrastructure, when that goes away, we have to figure out a way to fund the replacement of that. And then what natural resources are at risk. Uh, we have identified those hazards through our HIRA analysis. And so understanding the hazards and very clearly spelling out what we consider hazards. You know, major disasters, things like oil spills, hurricanes, uh, those big events are important to cover, but also small-scale events. What if you have a, a staff member injured on a boat? Uh, oftentimes here at the reserve, we're more than an hour away from medical help. And so we consider that to be a wilderness first aid situation. So we pursue training for much of our staff to in wilderness first aid so that we can take care of ourselves uh, in the event that we're, we're distant from, from medical help. And also, what are our emergency capabilities? We need to clearly outline those. What equipment do we have? What response capability do we have? Uh, next, you define an operations section of the plan. Obviously, you want to mitigate a, a disaster before it ever happens. And so what, what steps could we do to minimize things? And so if you take that to something like your, your uh, facilities, we want to maintain in our area a nice uh, fire break around the building so that we don't have a wildfire that potentially impacts the building. Uh, preparedness in both planning, training, and equipping your staff to respond, but also exercising that. And so at a minimum, we've defined that we have to have one exercise a year that keeps us in the mindset of being prepared for disaster. Uh, the response section of the plan, you're looking at the National Incident Management System, uh, your facilities, your awareness, what roles and assignments do people on your staff have, what are your priorities in planning, and importantly, what are your com communication plans? And then a section on recovery what kind of damage assessment will you do after a disaster, and how you recover from that. Next, a section on continuity of operations. Once that disaster is over with, how are you going to continue? What kind of resources do you have on hand? Do you have fuel for your generators? Do you have uh, water supplies? Just how are you going to respond? Uh, what are your personnel needs going to be, and what are your equipment needs going to be? And obviously, these are, these are concepts that are scalable based on the event that you're responding to. The plan should have a section on, on maintenance and appendices. Uh, one of the most important things to remember about a disaster response plan is this should be a living document. It should be reviewed annually at a minimum. Uh, you should review your capabilities. You should review your equipment that you have on hand. Have you had personnel changes? Are there trainings that need to be renewed? Exercising your capabilities is very important. It doesn't do much good to have uh, fancy response equipment or, say, an automatic uh, electronic defibrillator if you don't practice using those over time. There's also quite a bit of room in the plan for appendices that include your contacts, uh, hazard-specific procedures. So how are you going to respond 
specifically to a hurricane? How are you going to respond specifically to injury to personnel out in the field, uh, things like that? Once again, what are your emergency capabilities, your training work plans? Uh, we have space for response forms. Uh, those forms can be customized to your, to your site and to your agency, and then also maps and things like fact sheets for first responders. It's very important to think about uh, producing this in a, in a full-scale format, but also in a larger, for, uh, smaller format, such as the, the fact sheets. Uh, if you have a chance to meet with a responder who's going out for one day to, to lay boom, he's not going to read your entire 200-page disaster response plan. You need something very short and to the point that you can give to those people. Much of the success of a disaster response plan is going to be related to the effort that you put into uh, being thoughtful about the hazard and risk assessment, thought, thoughtful about your actual capabilities to respond, and then the ongoing maintenance and training to keep those capabilities up. Uh, we have to maintain very good communication with, with our local responders, uh, you know, staying in, in touch with our local fire departments, our, our emergency operations center, so that we understand what capabilities they have and where we stand on their, on their list of priorities when it comes to responding. Uh, the incident command system, we, one thing we found going through this process is that some of, our, some of the NEARs uh, in, the, in the Gulf were a little uneasy with getting very involved in the incident command system. Uh, they felt that the more they got their folks trained up in that, the more likely they might be to be pulled off into another event outside of the NEAR. Uh, that's obviously going to be a local concern. We took the view that uh, while we may not be an incident commander of a major disaster response, uh, Anytime something happens, we might be the incident commander until we're relieved by somebody with higher authority. If somebody's injured in the field, you're the incident commander until you get them back in and a first responder is able to take care of them. So we felt it very important throughout our, our, uh, throughout our whole chain of command to, to implement this. And maintaining a culture of preparedness uh, can really increase your staff safety, can make folks a lot more thoughtful about uh, field operations, and can help us to protect our, our valuable resources. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you, Will. This was, this was great. Um, and I encourage people to send in questions. You can do it by typing the questions into the, the question panel of your user interface. So um, there's a question. Do all the NEARs across the system have disaster plans or just Mississippi? Uh, at this point, not all the NEARs do. All five of the Gulf Reserves have, have plans. I believe there were four reserves that were developing plans uh, post-Hurricane Sandy, and I believe there's another round of reserves beginning to work on planning. So there should be at least nine reserves that either have plans or are developing plans at this point. Okay, great. Thank you, Will. Um, and this was in relationship to the acidic materials released from the adjacent facility. There was a question about whether there was an NRDA or a restoration, or if any restoration work is being done for that. Uh, there's actually ongoing uh, monitoring and, and actually litigation with the, the phosphate spill. Uh, there, there were fines levied with the initial large spill uh, back uh, several years ago, and some of the there's a chronic problem at this point that, that's being handled both by EPA and, and uh, the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. Okay, thank you. Um, and I should have asked you this uh, during the presentation, but on the risk assessment char chart that you showed earlier, uh, there was a question about what the scale was. Uh, the scales on the, e each question has a different scale, and actually uh, there wasn't room on the screen to show. There's actually a nice description, and that should be uh, available for folks to download. Uh, they're basically a scale on each question that gives you an idea of how to rank those, uh, but there just wasn't room on that slide to show it. Okay. Um, and speaking of slides, someone asked if you could uh, share the list of risks again, if you could flip back to that. Uh, the actual HIRO list or the... Um... Uh, they just said the list of risks. So. And, and um, Doug, if, if that's not what you wanted to... Oh, the table. Yeah. Okay, so we're on the table now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this list is, is just a generalized, basically a starting point for you, an example of how you would rank them. And obviously that's something that's going to be different at every site. Obviously here at Grand Bay, tsunami did not rank for us. Uh, earthquake was very low ranking. Uh, we had a, a much higher ranking on, on rail and hazmat uh, potentials. And so 
you know, this gives you a starting point. Uh, when you sit down in a room with people to start working on a hazard and risk assessment uh, and people begin to brainstorm, uh, the list can get quite cumbersome. And so you have to be realistic in what you expect to encounter. And so there are actually uh, some, some metrics there that, that give you some guidance on how you would, uh, what to include and what not to include. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Will. Um, there's several questions about whether the slides will be available. And Will uh, actually provided a lot of resources, um, uh, downloadable resources for this presentation. And on the page where uh, the record, once the recording is available, those other materials will also be posted there and be available to folks. Um, and I, will, would you be able to sh share the slides, Will? Yes, I'll share the okay. slides. And what I shared, uh, what will be available, is actually the Grand Bay response plan, as well as a, a template that, we, that was developed for the NEARS in general. And so that's a, a template of a response plan, and then also a hazard and risk assessment table. Okay, so if anybody is interested in getting that, if you could, um, you could email me, Sarah. Sarah underscore car at natureserve.org, and I can let you know where all that will be posted or if, um, uh, any of the other organizers that you have emails from uh, would be fine too, and they can, they can point you to that. Um, so let's see. There was uh, a question of are, are there any documented best management practices for response techniques, um, and have they been shared with the U.S. Coast Guard to include in the area contingency plan? We have been in, in discussions with the Coast Guard uh, to have these our disaster response plans shared. Uh, that, that was one of the things was trying to get more involvement with the Coast Guard and the, and the contingency plan development. Uh, here on the Gulf Coast, you know, there's a, the effort to uh, have digital contingency plans and online resources for that. And so we are actually going to be able to provide our, our disaster response plans, and those will be available as part of the contingency plan. Okay, and uh, with regard to, are there any documented best management practices for response techniques? That I, I would not, I, I okay. don't know that there are any best management practices out there. Okay. okay. Uh, let's see. Um, do any, there's a question, do any of the fact sheets developed for marine resources include endangered fishes? We did not include endangered fishes in ours because we didn't have any directly within the near boundary. But I'm unaware if, if any of the other reserves have done that. Uh, that okay. obviously would be site specific. Okay, and that's a, um, a good lead into the next, the next question. Um, do the NEARS have regional or, or even system-wide meetings where programs can share resources uh, such as your, your emergency response plan? We do. The, the NEARS actually has an annual meeting usually held in November uh, in the last few years has been at the uh, National Conservation Training Center in West Virginia, where all of the NEARS come together, all sectors, and we have a, a meeting. We also have virtual meetings of each sector once a year, where all of the stewardship coordinators come together and discuss and share. And so there's been quite a bit of sharing of this information and, and development among sites. Okay, great. Thank you. And is there any... Um, are there any sharing going on with other types of, uh, with any like national wildlife ref refuges or any other uh, types of protected areas? I do not know if this has been applied to any refuges. Uh, you know, getting it throughout the, the reserve system was our first goal, obviously, and, and uh, you know, obviously now the protected areas, getting a look at this, you know, we, we would love for this to be used in as many areas as possible. Okay. Uh, yeah, it looks like a tremendous resource, so. Um, hopefully we'll see more spread. Um, let's see, and there was a question, how do we find out when the next class is for the next level has Whopper certification? I've taken the basic course and would like to do the next course, and this is somebody who lives in San Diego. That's going to be very much a local, uh, local thing, because, you know, those has Whopper courses, there are private companies that offer those, uh, some employers offer them. I, you know, during Deepwater Horizon, those, those were provided uh, by the BP contractors uh, for, for state personnel. So I, I am unsure of how you would find, uh, you would just have to check with your supervisors on that. Okay. Um, and if anybody else has any questions, you can go ahead and send them in. Will, you did a tremendous job giving a very clear overview of, of this great and much needed resource. Uh, so we'll see if we, we'll just wait a minute and see if we get any more questions.
But One thing that I will mention quickly is that this is a process that is very site specific. You know, there's so many things that, that are only going to apply to a local resource and to your local response community. And so it really is something you just have to roll your sleeves up and, and get involved. And getting that stakeholder involvement, it, it was very, very important for us to get our first responders on board, let them know that, that you know, we were on the same page with them and that, that we wanted to work together. Okay. Yeah, and that's a great point to make. Um, and somebody wrote in and said that HASWOPER training is offered all around the country by commercial vendors and by EPA. So uh, as, as Will said, it's definitely local. So you need to find out for your local area. Um, and I'm getting lots of requests for the slides and the other materials, but no more questions have, have come in. So we'll go ahead and uh, close up. But Will, this, this was a great presentation for her really, really um, valuable resource. And we're really glad you could present today. And we hope you don't end up having to use your plans. Uh, <laughs> but we're glad they're there. Um, Thank you so much. OK. And one last comment. Um, Let's see, there, there was, uh, somebody said the National Spill Control S School also offers the HAZWOPER training. Um, and one place to check is for finding out uh, scheduling is the local emergency operations centers. Um, and then we had some other folks write in uh, thanking Will and saying it was a great presentation. So uh, I hope everyone has a great morning or afternoon, depending on where you are, and the rest of your day. And uh, we look forward to having you on future webinars. Many thanks to the NOAA National MPA Center for organizing this. Okay. All right.